and uh, since we were uh, opening with uh, uh, with uh, 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 a foreign language uh, quotes, I might start with uh, Ponte Santropoi Tuadena Regentai Vise, which is the opening of Aristotle's Metaphysics. It means all men by nature desire to know, and when I look at Milton Friedman, I can look at Milton Friedman in uh, many different roles, all of which involve knowledge and the search for knowledge and the uh, communication of knowledge. First, we have Milton Friedman, the economist. Um, Friedman, of course, uh, sought to enhance our understanding of, uh, of markets uh, and allowing us to say something predictive of the uh, economic situation. And when, um, uh, when he entered the field, uh, the Keynesians, in fact, did tend to dominate uh, uh, academic as well as other thinking on, uh, on economics. And the belief was that the government could simply manipulate the money supply and, do, and, and government spending and do all sorts of nice things. So if the economy were sluggish, the government could simply pump up the money supply, spend a lot of money that it didn't have, and the economy would heat up and there would be full employment, but eventually prices would start going up as well, and then the government would simply contract uh, 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 the spending and so forth. And the, this is how you manage an economy. Well, by the 1970s, it had a situation that the Keynesians simply couldn't explain. We had high inflation, and we had high unemployment, and we had a sluggish economy. Everything was going wrong. And Friedman understood that it had something to do with the money supply. And of course, he was the, uh, the, the uh, leading light of the monetarist uh, uh, perspective. Now, I too, at my doctoral dissertation was on the political and ethical implications of Ludwig von Mises' praxeology. So I take a slightly different view on monetary policy. But I think Friedman helped people understand that there are serious limitations to government control of the money and government trying to manage an economy by spending and t taxing and, 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 and so forth. This was Milton Friedman, the uh, economist. Um, and of course today, discussing the problems with the Federal Reserve is, has now become respectable again. Uh, thanks, of course, in uh, large part to Ron Paul. Uh, and. Uh, We'll see where that goes, but again, if you look at Milton Friedman, he certainly was on the right uh, track. Something else that he did in terms of economics, as an economist, I think was very important, which also was Milton Friedman as an advocate, was to work on the in Economic Freedom uh, Index. Um, I was actually the Heritage Foundation in uh, the uh, 80s and into the early 1990s, and I had this idea that maybe we can measure economic freedom and show the correlations between economic liberty and prosperity. I'd done some work at American University on this and thought it would be kind of a cool idea. And so I started to come up with the indicators when I was at Heritage. And then I heard, hey, there's another group out there doing the same thing. And it turned out that this was a group organized by Mike Walker from the Fraser Institute. Jim Guartney, uh, uh, Bob uh, Larson were involved in this group. Um, um, and others, Walter Block, people you probably know. And um, so I was invited I believe it was in fall 1990 to uh, Sea Ranch, which is just a mile up the road from Milton Friedman's home at Milton Rose Friedman's home in California, to participate in a Liberty Fund event on how to measure economic freedom. And I mean, it was uh, it was an incredible event because we had perhaps a dozen to 15 people, some of the ones I just mentioned, sort of leading economic minds, sitting around for three days, four days, trying to figure out how to measure economic liberty. And Milton and Rose Friedman, of course, were uh, the, the, were, were, were there, uh, putting in their two cents, really kind of leading and, and not only inspiring us, but uh, trying to help us along the way. And of course, what came out of that is that actually two separate indexes, one that's put out by the Heritage Foundation that I came up with the basic indicators, and then the one that's put out by uh, a number of groups internationally, uh, Cato in the United States, et cetera, and Fraser in Canada, and so forth. But this work that Milton Friedman did as an economist, um, uh, I think was very important. It's, it's kind of like an alternative to the, in, we have GDP indicators. So whenever you discuss economics, you have to talk about GDP growth, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea of what Milton Friedman was doing with the in economic freedom measures is that any serious discussion of economics has to 
has to take account of how free actually is the country. What has it been doing? It's been getting less free, more free. On what indicators? So I think a very important innovation coming out of Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman, of course, was also a policy advocate. And uh, he certainly influenced the Reagan administration, the Thatcher administration. Some of you know uh, Alan Walters, I suspect, uh, in, uh, in, in Britain, who worked for Thatcher and was influenced by Friedman. We've already heard, of course, about uh, what Friedman did in Chile. Um, we also see that he had an influence in China in the late uh, uh, 1980s, I believe it was. Um, 80s, I believe so, yes. Um, or no, 70s, sorry, the late 1970s. Um, the Cato Institute did a, an event over in China, I believe Milton was there, and uh, uh, of course had a lot of influence on the reformers in China. Finally, I want to mention Milton Friedman as a teacher and as a popularizer and a propagator uh, of free market ideas. It's one thing for the free market ideas to be in our heads and in academia and people who are studying the economy and so forth, but for them to have real effects, they have to be out in the broader public. People broadly have to understand what markets are, how they work. Um, otherwise, uh, the, the insights of the free market thinkers uh, you know, will have very, very little effect or influence. Uh, Milton Friedman, of course, is known to most people as a popularizer. In uh, 1980, he came out with a TV series and a book called Free to Choose. By the way, it's interesting, it's the same time that Carl Sagan came out with his book and series called Contact. And I like to say that what Carl Sagan was to popularizing astronomy, uh, literally in the same year Milton Friedman was to popularizing uh, economics. Uh, and if you, uh, if you look at the TV series or if you read the book, uh, you find that first of all you see Milton Friedman trying to make economics real. You see a globe-trotting Milton Friedman going from city to city, place to place, from market to market, from factory and industry to one after another, saying this is how it actually works. Let me uh, show you and demonstrate. It's also very interesting because what he did at the end of each show for the TV series is that he has sort of a panel discussion, a round table discussion with uh, people who were friendly to him, for example, a very young uh, 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 Walter Williams, Thomas Sowell, uh, Don Rumsfeld, who was a businessman at the time, is in one of those, and his opponents. He invited Joan Claybrook, who is a so-called consumer advocate, uh, to come and discuss what's the best way to protect consumers. We had a guy named Michael Harrington. Now, um, any of you young people probably don't even know who he was. In the 19... 60s and 70s, Michael Harrington was considered the sort of socialist of the future, an American socialist a thinker and so forth, whose ideas were just so profound. And Milton had him on the show and, of course, uh, bested him in arguments, and nobody knows who Michael Harrington is except for you know, some uh, marginal uh, leftists today. And if you look at the series, and as I say, the book, um, you find how relevant it is today. Uh, some conservatives might not like the fact that uh, Milton Friedman was for uh, an open immigration policy. Uh, he started off by pointing out that this country was built by immigrants, and immigrants came here because they wanted a better life, and it was the freedom in the United States that allowed them to progress uh, up. Uh, uh, in my family, I'm a, uh, Hudgens is not uh, is, is sort of English Welsh, however, right? <laughs> however, me and Madre Sekiyama, Lucia Giovina di Camelo, mi familia ha venuto de Abruzzo, I'm a half Italian, okay, that's why I talk like this. And, uh, you know, this is the American story, and Milton Friedman was quite clear about the uh, conservatives, you guys are wrong about closed markets in all uh, respects. If you look at uh, his comparisons of Hong Kong and China at the time, that was pretty powerful, saying, take a look at Hong Kong, destroyed after World War II, just like the rest of uh, Asia. Take a look at the difference between uh, Hong Kong today, that was back in 1980, versus uh, China. Um, you see Milton Friedman um, uh, talking about autarky, the problems of autarky, and back at the time, India, uh, you know, had decided, well, we're going to take up, with, at the time of independence, uh, Britain's really bad socialist ideas, which, unfortunately, they did. You know, if you look at the Indian flag, it, there's, a, there's a loom, you know, or a wheel, you know, for weaving uh, on the Indian flag. Isn't this a romantic notion? Everybody's going to weave their own cloth. And Friedman, of course, pointed out, this is absolutely absurd when you get a hundredth of the productivity that you would get at the factory. So instead of every Indian being able to afford, you know, uh, uh, clothing, 
you know, and get it in, you know, their equivalent of a Walmart. You know, they're doing it by hand, and that labor, of course, is not going into other stuff that it should go into, and that's how you, if you want to perpetuate property, what a great way of doing it. Friedman in the show and in the, um, in the book, and in, of course, many uh, op-eds and discussions and speeches, talk about who protects the worker best. It's a free market. It's not mandatory labor uh, uh, unions. Uh, it's not minimum wage laws, which in fact restrict worker opportunity. If you take a look at who protects the consumer, he does a great critique, and again, this is back in 1980 and of course in his subsequent works, on critiquing the Food and Drug Administration, which actually prevents drugs and life-saving uh, 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 products from getting to the market. The uh, Interstate Commerce uh, Commission at the time was at, had, had reached a point of absurdity where you had, you had to get government permission to put uh, a load in the truck and put it, ship it across the country. Trucks were forced to cross the country empty, even though there were customers all along the way saying, could you please stop and pick up my thing? No, 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 the government won't allow me to. Friedman did the critique of that. Most important, as we've seen in the video, Milton Friedman, even back then, decades ago, was talking about freedom and education. It was assumed back then that, well, of course the government has to run schools. Yeah, there's some Catholic schools out there, you know, and okay, maybe they're superior to uh, government schools, but you know, that's kind of you know, those Catholics, right? But, you know, what Milton Friedman said is, look, we need the magic, you might say, of the free market uh, operating in education as well. And uh, if he, if he was quite militant in the good sense of the word about the need for reform the educational system to allow parents to have choice. And of course, part of his legacy is a foundation uh, dedicated to freedom of choice in education. I believe that an education revolution is possible in this country, that education 20 and 30 years from now is going to look nothing like the industrial revolution 19th century model of how education works, which is where you have someone standing up in the front of the room and just simply feeding knowledge into brains. Education uh, can and will go through incredibly radical reform in the next couple of decades, but only, only if the people who are sending their kids to the schools have the power to control their own money. Milton Friedman as a popularizer was uh, perhaps one of the best things about him, and so I come here today, uh, yes, as an Austrian, I can crit criticize Milton Friedman on the gold standard, but I can praise Milton Friedman as one of the greatest advocates ever of capitalism and freedom and the dignity of each and every individual. Thank you.